Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome back to the Preacher's Corner. I'm Pastor Jay, and today we're going to be getting into John chapter number 8, beginning in verse number 31, and reading down to verse number 38. We're going to be covering at the first today the fact that the Word of God, the truth that Jesus proclaims, is that which shall set us free. If indeed we come to faith and believe. So, let's get started with a word of prayer. Father, we are grateful. We thank you for this day, for this time together. We pray that you will bless us as we consider the Word of God, that you will strengthen us, Lord, in our faith, that you will bring us, Lord, to a knowledge of the faith. On either case, that the Holy Spirit would do his perfect work in us, with us, and through us now, that we may rejoice in the blessed name of Jesus this day. Amen. All right, guys, in the reading of the word, we come to this place in verse number 31. Then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him, If you continue in my word, then are you my disciples indeed. And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. And they answered him, We be Abraham's seed, and were never in bondage to any man. How can you say that we shall be made free? Jesus answered and said to them, Verily I say unto you, Whosoever commits sin is the servant of sin. The servant abides not in the house forever, but the son abides forever. If the son therefore shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. I know that you are Abraham's seed, But you seek to kill me, because my word has no place in you. I speak that which I have seen with my father, and you do that which you have seen with your father. Now, uh, at, at this place, of course, from verse number 38, we're going to see that Jesus is going to incite a riot. (laughs) And essentially what we're talking about as concerning a riot is that which is happening inside the hearts of this people. You see, this spiritual truth that Jesus is speaking is going past their ears and reaching down into their hearts. And the reason why they're going to become so infuriated by what Jesus has to say in verse number 38 when he says, you do that which you have seen with your father. Is the, is the knowledge that everything that they're doing, all of the things that they're believing, all of the things that they're acting upon as concerning their religions and their creeds and their, 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 their processes and practices and rituals, all of that is for naught because none of that has what's brought them to a relationship with God. None of that has secured them in their, their walk with God. None of that matters. So ultimately, this this is going to uh, cause them to be furious. And the reason why begins actually up here in verse number 31. Uh, Jesus says these very important words. And Jesus said to those Jews which believed on him. Now, very important that we're going to discover that these Jews which believed on him, not very many of them actually believed on him. Now, what was their reasoning? Because a lot of people today claim to be Christians and claim to be believers in God or believers in Jesus, but the reality is is that the actions, activities, and and things of their lives are are just not evident to their words in in connection. In other words, uh, they say that they believe in God or believe in Jesus and that they are Christian, but they live their lives as though God doesn't exist, as if Christ wasn't real, as if the Word of God didn't have commandment for God's children to act and be certain things and ways. So, this is the concept of what Jesus is telling those who had just made the statement that they believed in him. He says, if you continue in my word. Now, this is one of those defining factors that would reveal the difference between a person that truly believes in Jesus from a person that that really doesn't believe at the core of their heart, even though they say they have believed, is that if you continue in my word, then you are my disciples indeed. The concept indeed 
it is is the recognition of truly. He would say, uh, if I were to word it in a different way, if you uh, continue or remain in my word, then you are my disciples, truly, or truly my disciples. And so we find that, that the word of God really becomes a defining factor at this point as far as a person's belief as concerning their faith, as concerning their their livelihood or their activity of connection to God's word. And he said that you shall know the truth in verse number 32 as being continuing in his word is what's giving you the knowledge of the truth. And that as disciples, as true disciples, you will be made free. The truth, the word of God will make you free. Now, these disciples, or these people, I should say, that claim to believe in Jesus are originally Jews who were under the discipleship of the Talmud. Now, there are two different, very different, I should say, distinguished sects of Judaism. One is an Orthodox Judaism that would be Talmudic, meaning that they would follow the oral written traditions of the rabbis of old in, in their, their practice in faith. Another group would be called the Karite Judaism, and the Karite Jews would be those who do not consider the, the writings of the Talmud to be authoritative, but only the Word of God itself as being authoritative for practice and for belief. And so even within Judaism, you have that which is, is Talmudic or following after the traditions and the, the writings of the elders more so than the Word of God. And you have the, the Karaites, which are those who, who would have faith alone in the Word of God alone for the glory of God alone. So very important these two distinctions because we also we also see these distinctions as they exist inside of Christianity today as there would be those who would be be very much in in line with the catechistic teachings and the doctrines of the faith is believing that that the writings of of their their traditions and the writings of their forefathers would be the more authoritative thing to follow for being pleasing in God unto salvation, whereas you would have the other side uh, of the the road being those who would claim biblical authority alone by faith and the word of God alone toward Jesus Christ alone to the glory of God alone. So it would be this, this connection that you will find even in Christianity today as it is discovered in Judaism during the time of Jesus. And, and in those two distinctions, ultimately what you're going to discover is, is that there's a third part to this. And that is a relational part, a relationship part. Now, the Word of God is extremely important and is necessary for our daily understanding as we grow in, in knowing God better. And the only way we're going to be able to know God, what He likes, what He doesn't like, and, and what His desire is for our lives, how to live out His desire through our lives, is by the Word of God. But ultimately, the Word of God is meant as a, a channel to be able to bring us into a fellowship of communion with God and so that our relationship is built up in Christ. Our relationship is built with God and so that we, we no longer are more, de more dependent upon the, these, these things that, that would drive us as far as all of these different positions and all of these different things schools of thought and things of that nature, but that we would be driven to the inward man seeking out the, the, the through the Holy Spirit the truth of what is contained here in the reality of God's Word for us and for the world around us. Because there's going to be plenty of times, just like Jesus is about to be met with in, in their answer in verse number 33, as Jesus said, if you continue in my word, you are going to be my disciples, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Well, they answered Jesus, we are Abraham's seed. 
Now, this is where they kick back, they fall back, they say, whoa, 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 wait a minute. Because Jesus has just told him, the, these guys, that the, the discipleship of Jesus is found to be a relational discipleship that, that is to be bonded together through the Word of God. And that this the, the Word of God, which, by the way, is Jesus himself. It's in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God, and the, and the same became flesh. The Word became flesh. So we understand <coughs> that Jesus is that connectional Word. But, but the reality is, is that it was that Jesus is going to make us free through that spirit of truth that he places inside of his believers as he draws us to the Word of God in that connectional relationship that we weren't able to bear at the beginning of our salvation, just as the disciples weren't able to bear at the very beginning all things that God would have for them. But as they grow in their understanding of God's Word, they also grow in the, in the nature connection of relationship with God. And it's through the work of the Holy Spirit that a person really has that connection. Well, these guys immediately begin to reject the concept that they were slave to anything, such as slave to sin or slave to Rome or slave to, to, to self and slave to religion and slave to, to you name it, sin. Again, and and Jesus really brings that out is that when you come to him, you are set free. And that freedom comes with a with a relational connection uh, unto God, but but that it is set free from the wickedness of this world and sin. But these guys, they couldn't quite grasp the concept of that. And so they say, well, we're Abraham's seed and we're never in bondage to any man. Well, no. That's not exactly true, is it? Obviously that they're in bondage to Rome, and before Rome they were in bondage to Greece, and before Greece they were in bondage to, to the Medo-Persian kingdoms, and from the Medo-Persians they were in bondage to, to Babylon, and from Babylon their northern kingdoms were in bondage to Assyria, and, and, and throughout the books of the judges they were brought into bondage and then delivered, and then brought into bondage and then delivered, so they spent a lot of their life in bondage to lots of different uh, kingdoms, lots of different men, but here they they see themselves as not being in bondage, even though they're answerable to all of Rome and to the to the will of Rome. They're still answerable, but they they they've got this idea that they're free, they're perfectly free, and and the same is true with us in the United States today. Is that we have this concept that we are perfectly free, even though we we wouldn't dare not pay our taxes as concerning tax season now as understanding that the IRS would come in, all of our all of our stuff would be seized, we'd be thrown in jail, uh, we, we, we would have all of these different things uh, transpiring, so we pay our taxes because we're afraid of the government, but we would see ourselves as being perfectly free. And we, we would see ourselves as being perfectly free, but praise God, we're going to pay our property taxes from the state level, and we're going to we're going to pay our, our, our stickers and our tags for our cars and all of these different things that we would do for fear of a government's uh, control over our lives that we would pay these things, but we still claim we are free. And it's the same thing that these Jews were doing at this period of time that Jesus was saying this to us. Now, the freedom that, that is, is made to us is, is several fold, but the freedom that Jesus is, is speaking of is a freedom from, from sin's authority over our lives. And what a true blessing that freedom is. And another freedom is, is our, our freedom from death because of the gift of his eternal life. And so that we no longer have to worry about death. We no longer have the stronghold of sin having governance over us. We no longer have the, the power of the prince of the air. It's what the devil was recognized in Ephesians chapter 2 at one time when we were children of disobedience and we were dead in our trespasses and sins because of the mercy of God and the love of God and the richness of his grace. He has set us free and made us alive in Christ, and we no longer have any of those things. We are truly free from all of these kinds of bondage. 
And as would, would be said in, to the Galatian church in Galatians chapter number 5 and verse number 1, the, the apostle Paul would say, Stand fast in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made you free, and be not entangled again in the yoke of bondage. Well, Jesus is telling these guys that they don't have to be a slave to the the, the dictates of, of the Judaistic religion anymore. They don't have to be a slave to fear and a slave to, to hate or to anger. You don't have to be a slave of these, these things, these spirits that control us in this governments, in this world that, that tries to, to have ownership of us. We don't have to be slaves to these things anymore if we would become disciples of Christ and continue in his word and be set free by the love of God, by the power of Jesus Christ, by the authority of Jesus and God, by, by the redemption and, and the reconciliation and the restoration. There's so much to say about it. From 2 Corinthians chapter number 5, beginning of verse 17, all the way down to the end of the chapter, there's so much to be said about the freedom that we can have in Christ if we would continue in His Word and become His disciples. But a lot of us end up just like these guys that claim that they believed in Jesus until it got real. <laughs> and we would say, wait a minute, we're not slaves to anything. We were never in bondage to any man. So how can you tell us that you're going to set us free? Well, Jesus explains this. He teaches this very truth right here as, as he says, Verily I say unto you, whosoever commits sin is the servant of sin. Well, it, it's very clear that those things which we are committing are often those things which we will find ourselves servant to. Because in the committal of the actions, we are actually serving those things, right? So, a uh, prime example, as as I would uh, just recently taking care of funeral services, as as I I said, yes, I will serve you. Then I commit to that service, which means that I'm going to be there uh, for that family. I'm going to show up uh, in the, in the time uh, well before the time that this thing begins. I'm gonna I'm gonna invest every ounce of of ability and and wisdom and anything that that God has has given me to be able to do this this task because that I have I have committed to the service of, of this family then then that's just it I'm committed to this I, and I can't back out I'm not going to back out wouldn't even think of backing out just as I would make a commitment to a, the, the church here at Martin as they have received me to be their pastor and so I've come with a commitment of bringing the word of God of bringing the love of God of bringing the the, the, everything that goes with that, the times of personal counseling and the times of, of help out on the farms and, and the times of whatever it is, it's this commitment uh, that has been made and, and the service that goes with that. Well, the same thing is true as concerning sin. People often are, are drowned in, in addictions to alcohol or illegal drugs. They're drowned in addictions to to sex and sexuality or to food and, and, and just about anything that you could possibly think of in this world where people have a great desire, it can easily be claimed an addiction. And so that we would find that those things that we are committed to are the things that we are engrossed in, that we're going to do, that we're going to dream of that that we will often act on without even giving any serious thought to it because it's something that is so desired within us that we're going to do and Jesus he tells these guys that that even though they're Jews and even though they've been circumcised on the eighth day of their birth and even though they've gone through their mitzvah and have been been declared a bar mitzvah or a bat mitzvah for the ladies as sons and daughters of the commandments, and even though they, they may be in the eyes of God, a people claim to be connected to Israel and therefore connected to the promises and believe themselves to be secured in Yahweh, believe themselves to be secured for a position in the kingdom of God and of heaven, yet they, they do not realize that all of those things are external things of the flesh and that none of those things can secure the soul for, for salvation. None of those things can 
can necessarily do any effectual work of, of grace or any merit of grace whatsoever, and that they, they have borne themselves to the idea of being Israel in their connection of the flesh and so living their lives under a committal of service to sin and, and following sin and committing sin and, and, and living for sin instead of for God. And the truth will be revealed through the word of God that 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 you cannot be this this kind of of sinner, this this full fledged and committed sinner as servant of sin, and be with Christ and be a part of God and be in in the kingdom of God or connected to God whatsoever. And so he says, I say to you in verse number thirty four, whosoever commits sin is the servant of sin. And, and he makes known that the servant does not abide in the house forever. In other words, you've got a period of time in your life to be able to live. There's an appointed time. It's revealed again in Hebrews 9.27. There's an appointed time unto man wants to die. And after this, the judgment. And so the, certainly the servant of sin is not going to abide in this life forever as it was in this tabernacle or this house forever. And that there is coming a time that is appointed. And if we do not commit our heart unto Christ and we do not surrender unto to Christ and, and unto salvation by repentance and repenting of our sins and, and trusting in faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and in his resurrection and the gift of God and eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord, that, that we are going to be separated from God for an eternity. We will have no life. We will have no connection of love or anything else, for God is life. God is love. And so Jesus says that, that whoever commits sin is the servant of sin, and the servant does not abide in the house forever. But here's the key, verse number 35, but the Son abides forever. Now, see, those who are in the Son are, are going to abide forever. They are secured in the Son. This is why Jesus said that if you continue in his word, then you become his disciples. And the knowledge of the truth is what sets you free because the truth brings you to Christ. And as you enter the Son, you will abide forever with the Son. For he who knew no sin became sin for us that we might be made the righteousness of God in Him. It's that connectional relationship. That as you come into Christ, and, and Jesus said, All who come to me that are drawn to me of my Father, remember that in John chapter number 6, He said, All who come to me, I will in no wise cast them out. Uh, there was no way I'm going to get rid of them. He said, I will not lose one, but will raise them up in the last day. But now, if you are if you are the servant of sin and the committing of sin, and you're living for sin, then you are a servant of sin, and that will not abide in the house forever. For sin has already been condemned by the Father; it's already been judged, and so that you have a period of time in this life. But when this life is over, you will be locked up in the holding facility known as hell until the time of judgment of Revelation 20, in which case you will be brought before the throne room to be judged according to your sins and then to be cast into a lake of fire to a second death because you had the opportunity in the period of time in this life in this moment to be able to enter the sun to be able to come to to jesus by faith and in repentance to salvation but you've rejected him and so he says the Son abides forever, and you shall abide forever in the Son if you've come to Him by faith. <clears throat> and he says in verse 36, If the Son shall make you free, then you shall be free indeed. And the very, the very concept of, of Jesus and the authority of a great conversation today about authority, the, the very Son in His authority, Authority has power to set the captive free. 
and only the Son. Man cannot set himself free, for man was, was never born in a state of freedom to be able to have freedom. For instance, a person born into freedom that is stolen into slavery can indeed uh, fight for that freedom again, having known what that freedom was. And ultimately, you will find something very similar to this existent when you see that Jesus, uh, literally given unto death, was, was brought under such a condemnation by the Father as paying for the sin of the whole world, that Jesus would literally grapple uh, with death, with hell, with the grave. Jesus would grapple with sin. He would, he would wrestle it into the ground, and he would pin it to where it belongs in that pit of hell, and he would, he would, he would gain victory over that ultimately through the fight of his life and be resurrected unto the victory of, of conquering death, hell, and the grave on our behalf. Because he who is free knows that freedom, though being brought into subjugation to all of that, that, that wickedness and all of that death and, and everything, still gains victory over it to come to that freedom that now, as Jesus has done for us, has opened up that freedom unto us all who will come to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. He said, Whosoever comes to me, I shall in no wise cast out. I'll raise him up the last day. The Apostle Paul says that, that with the heart man believes and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. He said, If you would confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe that God has raised him from the dead in your heart, you shall be saved. In Romans chapter 10 and verses 9 and 10. And, and this is the reality that Jesus is speaking to these Jews that if you would be my disciples, then you will be in my word. You will know my love for you. You will know my authority over you and you will be free in that authority. You will be free. And these guys, they just scoffed at it. They said, wait a minute now. I'm already free. I've never been a slave to anybody. I've been Abraham's seed. But the, the very statement of saying that I am, we are of Abraham's seed is the acknowledgement that you are under the authority of Abraham at that point. You're under the authority or under the, the servanthood of the circumcision that came from Abraham. And so that you would say, well, wait a minute, we are of Moses. Okay, well, now you're, you're saying that you are, you are a servant to the law that came through Moses, or rather Abraham and circumcision or Moses and the law. You're still a slave to these external things that were never meant to be controls, but meant to be evidences or meant to be spiritual realities that were done through physical nature. And so it comes down. He says, if, there, if the Son, in verse 36, therefore shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. And, and he said to them in verse 37, I know that you are Abraham's seed. He said, I know you're the children of Abraham. Well, Jesus is a child of Abraham according to the flesh, is he not? I mean, after all, he comes from the tribe of Judah as being born at Bethlehem, and his mother and father both have connection to Bethlehem and the tribe of Judah. So, uh, th that Judah would be the fourth son of Leah from 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 Jacob, which whose name is changed to Israel, who is the son of Isaac, who is the son of Abraham. So Jesus is just as much the seed of Abraham as any of the rest of the people that he's talking to. But it's not the point. Jesus tells them, I know that you are the seed of Abraham, but this is the key. You seek to kill me. You see, it, it's a fallacy for them to claim to be Abraham's seed and yet seek to kill anyone, really, but seek to kill the very Messiah who has fulfilled so many prophecies and has already done so many signs and wonders in their sight. And, and, and he says, you, I know that you are the seed of Abraham as concerning the flesh, but your heart is far from God. Why? 
because you seek to kill me. He said, because my word has no place in you. Now, the word of God as concerning the teachings of Jesus, as concerning the doctrines of the faith that are that are revealed evidently through the writings of, of the word of God, but also that word, it's not just the the teachings alone it's not just the the those things those doctrines alone it's the relational aspect of god working in you through those things that binds you to himself and so if you would have known if you truly had a relationship with god these jews if they truly had a relationship with god then they would be rejoicing in the works of Jesus as he does these miracles, these signs, these wonders. They would be praising God for the things that are happening in the lives of all of these people around Jesus instead of desiring for his death. And the reason why the multitude of these religious leaders desire the death of Jesus is because they don't want to lose their status as religious leaders, they don't want to lose their prowess among the people. They don't want to be de de escalated from from their positions of authority to surrender those positions unto the King of Kings and Jesus. And so you see that it isn't about the teachings of Jesus. It isn't about the doctrines of the Word of God as being revealed through Jesus. It's relationship. They hate him because they fear their own authority's loss. And it's a relationship issue. And Jesus brings that out, but oftentimes we miss it. But he does. He says, I know that you are Abraham's seed. He's not doubting the fact that he's dealing with his fellow Jews. Jesus is Jewish. Jesus is a Jew. He isn't a Galilean, and he isn't a Benjamite, and he isn't, he isn't a, 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 what, a, a, now the brothers have slipped my mind, a Zebulonite. He isn't from Zebulun, and he, he isn't from a Joseph, and he isn't from any of these other brothers that, that are out there that make up the 12 tribes, the 12 different nations that come together to be Israel. Jesus is from the tribe of Judah. He's a Judean. He's a Jew. And he said, I know that you're Abraham's seed, but you seek to kill me because my word has no place in you. And he says in verse number 38, I speak that which I have seen with my father. Now, let me say it again. I speak that which I have seen with my Father. Jesus, I mean, he knows who he is at this point. I was talking to a dear brother in Christ today, and we were talking about that knowledge of Christ at the time that, that, that his omniscience was present in his, in his state of divinity, that he knew that he was God. He knew of his time with the Father in heaven. He, he knows the, the presence of the Spirit that dwells within him. He's, he's fully aware of, of being truly God, even though he is truly man. He's fully aware. And, and it's at that time in the temple when he's 12 years of age when he tells his mom, he says, you've been looking for me? He says, don't you understand? I have to be about my father's business. And it's this connection that is recognized in Christ during that period of time. And so that, that he, would, he would remember, he would have that heart of the Holy Spirit to know that fellowship that he had with God in eternity past. He would he would have this this whole fullness of the Godhead as, as it speaks of Jesus. The Apostle Paul reveals Jesus is the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And so he would have that, that omniscience of what it was like with God before man was created. And he would have that omniscience of what it was like to be with God. And, and he has this this understanding even in in the connection of his humanity of what it is to be in prayer with God and what it is to be connected to God even though it's through the flesh and he and he has this continual fellowship relationship with God and so he says I speak that which I have seen with my father here's the rage he says you all of y'all and these Jews all of them he says 
you do that which you have seen with your father. Now you see, they claim Abraham's seed. And so as they would make that claim, and Jesus would say this statement in verse number 38, they would assume that their father was Abraham. Now, uh, if you're wondering how I make that connection, just remember when that rich ruler, remember the rich man that went down into hell and then Lazarus dying and him being in Abraham's bosom, remember that rich man. He cried out and he said, Father Abraham, send Lazarus that he might dip his finger into the water and quench my, my tongue. So this is a common thing thought process for these Jews is to say, well, Abraham is our father. Well, they totally missed the boat on that one because Abraham even told that rich guy, who's like, sorry, son, uh, the wrong guy to be calling out for this. He said, I can't come over there. The gulf is too wide. And he says, you can't come over here. In other words, it's too late for you. Just as Jesus was saying up at the top of this at the beginning, you know, it's too late for you to be able to, to, to change at this point. You know, when Jesus said, if you continue in my word, then you are my disciples and you shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free and he said the servant abideth not in the house forever there's this period of time that is going to happen that 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 is going to be that separation unless you enter into the son who abides forever and gives you ability through himself to abide forever in him and, and so the rich man is begging, but the begging does no good because there's nothing that can be done for him at this point. It's all settled. It's settled in heaven forever. And he stands condemned. And so what Jesus says, I speak which I have seen with my father. The, the, there's a contradiction that exists between Jesus and these Jews. So if Jesus is talking about his father, then who do the Jews turn to? What father are they going to claim? Of course, we know that, that they claim Abraham as their father. And of course, we know that they ultimately are going to claim Yahweh or, or the, the, the great God as their, their father. So they're going to try and condemn Jesus. But this is where we get into... The beauty that the the these uh, Jews are going to ultimately try to accuse Jesus of having the devil as being his father, and let's just see what what happens when Jesus nails him. So I'm going to read down from verse number 39, and and I'm going to read down to verse number 47, and we'll talk about this in a great deal more detail tomorrow. But I really want to get into the reading of this. You are your father, the devil. It's a very powerful section of Scripture we don't want to miss, but let's let's look at it real quick. Just as we read through it so that we're prepared to be able to get into it tomorrow. Verse number 39 begins, They answered and said unto him, Abraham is our father. Jesus then says to them, If you were Abraham's children, you would do the works of Abraham. But now you seek to kill me, a man that has told you the truth, which I have heard of God. This didn't Abraham do? You do the deeds of your father, Jesus said in 41. Well, then in, in verse number 41, the, the people, the Jews, respond to him, We're not born from fornication. We have one father, even God. Right there, right there in verse number 41, those Jews just made the claim that Jesus was a bastard. Right there. They said, we're not born of fornication. The, the very concept is, we're not bastards. We know who our father is. We have one father, even God. Essentially, they're calling Jesus a son of Satan because of an illegitimate birth that he's always had to, to, to bear with because of the ignorance of a people not accepting the, the prophecy's fulfillment of his birth. And so verse number 42, Jesus said to them, If God were your father, you would love me, for I proceeded forth and came from God. Neither came I of myself, but he sent me. Why do you not understand my speech? This is a question I often have for people. Why do you not understand my speech, even because you cannot hear my word? 
Jesus answered the question for him because they would have thought that they could understand what he was saying, but it's because they didn't understand his, his word. They didn't have a relational connection with him that they couldn't grab it. He said, you are of your father the devil. You, on the other hand, are of your father the devil. And the lust of fa- your father you will do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and they're all trying to kill him, right? That's pretty much proof that they are chasing after the wrong father. He said he was a murderer from the beginning and abode not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. And when he speaks a lie, he speaks of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. And because I tell you the truth, you do not believe me. Which of you convinces me of sin? In other words, which of you can convict me of a sin committed? He says, and if I say the truth, why do you not believe me? So if you can't convict me of sin, which means I'm telling the truth, then why aren't you going to believe the things that I'm telling you? He that is of God, in verse 47, hears God's words. You, therefore, hear them not, because you are not of God. Oh, praise the Lord. Oh, these guys are going to be so beside themselves. And again, we'll get into this in greater detail uh, tomorrow, which would be Wednesday. We'll get into this in greater detail because it's just so powerful what is being said by Jesus here. And I wouldn't want to miss one word that is being spoken from Jesus' mouth because a lot of these things that we'll get from verse uh, 39 beginning in, in, in our reading, we're going to be going from 39 down to 47 tomorrow. A lot of these things are completely relational, completely. Now, there's no question about the teaching that is being given, and there's no question about the doctrine that is represented in, in the person of God, the person of Jesus, and to salvation, and all of these different things. But it's all relational in how it connects to us. It's all in the way that we would respond to it, the way that we would receive it in our heart, the way that we would believe upon it, and in that belief to act upon it. It's all connectional. So we need to have time to be able to connect with it. So let us turn to the Lord, just thanking Him for the blessing that we have received today in in the conversation that Jesus gives with these folks as concerning being set free Uh, Not really as much set free, but being made free in Christ by His Word as we continue as His disciples. And the reality of being servant, certainly if not to God, then to sin and to Satan, really. And that we need to be set free from the Son as we receive that today. And if we were truly the children of God, that we would be looking for Jesus. We would be searching Jesus out and not desiring the world and just to kill Him in that place and and to truly know the Father. So let us thank Him for this blessing today. We are grateful, Lord. We ask that You will be with us as we consider these teachings You have given us today as reading the Word of God, that we would hear those words written in red, representing our Savior as He speaks, Lord, and that we would take it into our hearts and and build upon our relationship with God through Jesus, and that we would just understand even better what it is to be in Christ. And we'll thank you and praise you for what you do in us, with us, and through us in this moment. In Jesus' name and for his sake, amen. Well, God bless you guys, keep you guys, and cause his face to shine upon you. And we'll catch you tomorrow for the this portion of Scripture as concerning the argument of whose father is truly the devil. <laughs> Y'all take care.